mortgages. <sighs> Not always a fun conversation, but this one is. Welcome to episode three of How's the View podcast. Let's bring in my new friend, Rich. Okay, what's your last name? List. Rich List? <laughs> That's your name? That's my name, yes. <laughs> wow. Uh, Rich List. Rich is actually, or is it Richard? It's Richard. Yeah, in fact, Richard. I'm actually Richard the Third, and uh, and we have a son, uh, Richard the Fourth. So um, we figured it had already been going that long. We we might as well go another another generation. That so, is Richard the Third. Okay, you're Richard the Third, yeah. and then you have your son is Richard the Fourth. Yeah. Oh yeah. my goodness, that is gold <laughs> with that last name, Rich List. Rich, thanks so much for being on the podcast today, the House of You podcast. How yeah. are you? Excellent. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you're having a good to week. Be here today. Good. I've been a little under the weather, but oh, uh, no. I'm feeling better today. So No COVID? This, no COVID, okay, yes, good. thankfully. Yeah, you're safe, I think. No, it's fine. I'd be, <laughs> I'd be good no matter what. It's oh, all good. 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 Yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about you yeah. for our listeners. Uh, your name is Rich List. It is the coolest <laughs> name I have ever heard. It's perfect for like, the real estate. I, I was like born to be in real estate somehow. My goodness, seriously. <laughs> okay, so where are you from? Where do you live now? I mean, I know where you live. You're, we're currently in yeah. Colorado, but kind of give me yeah. a little bit of an elevator pitch about sure. who you are. Sure. So, um, so I grew up in Western Montana. Okay. Um, outside of a town called Missoula, which Gorgeous. those of you um, who don't know it, no one really knows Montana until just recently. Because um, of Yellowstone? Yellowstone. Yeah. So the ranch that my wife and I are both from there, actually, we're uh, junior high sweethearts. Wow. Uh, the ranch that she grew up on was actually adjacent to that ranch that's now the Yellowstone Ranch. So everyone knows where we're from now. <laughs> oh my goodness. That is so cool. Do you like Yellowstone? Yeah. Well, of course, right? Yeah, I'm from there. No. It's all filmed there in, in yeah. our hometown. So uh, it's a little, a little cheesy well, sometimes, but it's like know. a cowboy soap opera. Yeah, that's that's what I right. say. Yeah. yeah. We really enjoy it. Um, okay. So you're from Montana and then from there you moved here to Colorado? No. So, um, so my wife and I grew up together and, um, you know, where we grew up in a small town in those days, everyone just got married and stayed. Right. And um, that wasn't really our picture. And so um, my idea was to go to school in New York. And I did that. My wife ended up going to school in Southern California. So we spent several years uh, kind of living apart like that. Um, we ended up getting married after a few years. But um, in New York is when I got into the mortgage business. So did you go to NYU? No, I went to New York State up. Okay. Upstate. Okay. Cool. And um, and my aunt was in the mortgage business, and uh, it's funny that it's it's kind of mortgages is now in our family. I think there's ten of us now that are in the mortgage business, one way or another. But I was getting ready to finish school. Um, what was your degree in? Um, business. Business, right? Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Know, you know, for everyone who doesn't know what they want to do, they become a right business. that or communications. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So she said, um, I remember my aunt Tree. She said, Hey, I think you'll be great at mortgages. And I said, That sounds great. No one said I'm really going to be great at anything. So I'm uh -huh. glad somebody has an idea of what I should be when I grow up. And uh, I started doing mortgages uh, right after 9-11, actually. Wow. So were you in New York for 9-11? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so wow. I was going to school at that time um, and then finished school um, and started getting into the mortgage business at that time. Wow. Okay. So how old were you then? 21, 22. Okay. So you've been in the mortgage industry for? Basically my whole life, more or less. Yeah. yeah. So a little, you know, 22 years roughly, give or take. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So my wife and I lived in New York and we really enjoyed it for so several years. So she ended years. up moving out to New she York from New York. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. guys did long distance. We did the long distance for several Impressive. years, actually. Um, and, and when we finally moved and, and got married, um, you know, we knew that wasn't where our long-term home was. And so mm -hmm. as we started looking around in the early 2000s, the mortgage industry was exploding, right? Kind of the opposite of right now, kind of like the, the, the market that we just came out of where mm -hmm. banks were expanding. The bank I worked for at the time was large and they were looking to expand. And they said, hey, why don't you pick where you want to go? And uh, Colorado Springs at that time seemed like kind of the, the, the right balance oh, wow. between where we were and uh, where we were from. And so we've been here ever since. And did you, had you already been here before? Did you guys come to check it out? My wife's family was originally okay. from Denver, or a lot of them were. And so we were regulars uh, mm -hmm. in the area. Okay. Um, but when you're young and you're in your 20s, you know, we look back and think, was there a ton of thought that went into that? And I, I don't know. I think God had a plan for us, obviously. Um, but I remember we just kind of rolled into Colorado Springs one day and um, and said, ah, oh, this, this place will be pretty good. And... Um, and it has been, and we've been wow. here since. That That's time. great. Yeah. So you've been married for how long? 
Um, over 20 years now, 21 years this year. Congratulations. Yeah. That's a big deal. Yeah. Huge deal, actually. <laughs> uh, and you have how many kids? We have three young children. Oh, that's great. And so you guys moved here to Colorado Springs in what year? <laughs> uh, 2004. 2004. Okay, so you guys, you've been in mor- the mortgage industry through all the craziness. Yeah. You've seen the ups, the downs, mm-hmm. the all arounds, right? Yeah. Um, you guys moved out here in 2004. What was the, what did it look like in the real estate world in 2004? Well, 2004 and five, the market was really on that uptrend. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the, the business was really pretty good at mm-hmm. that time. Um, and that's why the bank that I had worked for was looking to expand in markets outside of where they had banking branches. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's why Colorado Springs was on their radar of, of a place they wanted to be. And I just happened to be the, the one that said they'll do it. Yeah. Um, and so the market was thriving mm-hmm. and it really was until maybe 2007 or eight, right, when everything right. kind of fell apart. That's what everyone goes back to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for me, it was a blessing in disguise. I think partly because of my age and partly of kind of the maturity, the natural maturity that it takes is over the course of a career. Um, you know, well, well, that recession that happened in the housing crisis really knocked out a lot of folks. I think maybe I was too young and too dumb to know any better. And so I just kind of kept plugging. And when things turned around, that's when my business really took off. Yeah, yeah. So before we jump into View Mortgage, I do want to just ask this. A lot of people talk about how right now we are currently back in 2008. I hear that all the time. We're back in 2008, yada, yada, yada. Uh, What would you say to those people? Do you think Um, we're back in 2008? No, I don't think so. Although it's a scary time like 2008, right? We saw the banks are falling apart again, just like then. We saw that twice this past week. Um, there's fundamental differences between what's going on in our economy today and what was going on 10 or 15 years ago. Um, one of the, the largest indicators that you can see that from is, is the number of homes on the market. There were something like three to four million homes after the crash or during the crash of 2008 and nine. Um, today, nationally, I think there's um, less than a million homes on the market. When you compile that with how many more families and how many more people our population has uh, increased quite a bit since then, mm-hmm. um, we're severely overserved when it comes to housing units. And so, no, yes, I think we're in, re- in a recession-like environment right now, mm-hmm. and housing has kind of been kind of the first hit, right? It was kind of housing, crypto, that both really took the biggest um, you know, blow on the chin with what's happened with mortgage rates. Um, but, no, I don't think that they really correlate at all, to be honest with you. Well, that's comforting. <laughs> yeah. So it's a little bit of a trying time, but it is not 2008. I don't think so. Yeah. No, no, I don't, th- I don't think so. It is a completely different market too. Yeah. Right. I mean, when you just look at, if you look at what the numbers were, um, then versus now, what we're experiencing right now is, is our market was overheated through the COVID and through those artificially low interest rates. Um, Do you think we'll ever see those interest rates again? Uh, hopefully not, because I think that means there's probably <laughs> another world crisis that's probably worse than uh, than you know yeah. a higher mortgage payment. Mm-hmm. So no, probably not. I think rates will come down from where they are presently. Mm-hmm. I think they're probably overinflated at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there's a high likelihood that over the next couple months, what we've learned over this kind of period of time is that when it, when inflation goes up, interest rates follow. So if I were to give you a $100 bill today as a lender, the idea for me is that I'm going to give it to you and charge you interest, right? You're going to pay me back in the future. You're going to take my $100 and buy a good or service that's valuable to you today. You're going to then promise to say, pay 10%, right? You're going to pay me $110 next year. That's what's in it for me. Um, and that's the basics of how lending works. There has to be something in it for both right. of us. When inflation kicks in, especially at the high levels that we were seeing last year, there's really nothing in it for me. Yes, you're paying me $110, but my $110 isn't worth what I thought it was when I lent you the money. Mm -hmm. And so when banks and lenders are looking at that, not just here, but across the world, they're saying, if my dollar is being eroded more quickly than the amount of interest that I'm charging a consumer, what's in it for me? And so I have to raise that rate to make it make sense. Yeah. So it you almost need that to level everything out. Exactly. Out. Okay. Right, exactly. And so that's why you think we will potentially see interest rates come out and things start to level out in the market. Yeah. I, it's I, why I, eggs are so expensive. Right. Yeah. Well, there's a supply and demand issue as well. That's true. That's and, true. And I can't gonna, blame everything and, on interest rates. <laughs> <laughs> inflation. No, and, no yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's a different issue. But I think we're going to be in the same thing with housing. We are in a supply and demand situation with housing. 
I think the number is 900 units nationally, and that is obviously different from city to city. Um, but that number is significantly lower. And what have we seen over the last year, both at View Homes and across the country? Home builders learned their lesson in the last downturn. And so right away, they've pulled back on permits, they've pulled back on starts, um, and you see it all across the country. So when home buyers start to come back, when interest rates do come down a percent or maybe two percentage points from where they are now, we're going to have an egg situation, as you pointed out, um, yeah. where there's too, there's too few homes and too many buyers that want to take them on. Interesting. So it's going to be an up, down, up, down type of thing. I don't see how we avoid yeah. it. And that's the only way you can really last in the real estate world, right? Is if you can ride the wave. You have to assume you it's have to change all the time. All the yeah. time. Yeah. So let's jump into View Mortgage. Yeah. Uh, View Mortgage is in what cities is, is View Mortgage um, in? We're throughout Texas and Colorado. So uh, okay. several t markets in Texas. Okay. Um, and then throughout Colorado as well. We're also um, in Southern New Mexico. Okay. Um, so we're really trying to serve anywhere where we're building homes is the home builder side. We're trying to serve from, from a retail lending aspect. Yeah. And you are a partial owner of View Mortgage, correct? Right. You really drive that. What brought you into that world? What started off View Mortgage? So I think it was built behind the concept of how much respect that I have for, for the View company and the View family and the people that are behind it, um, probably more than anything else. We've been working together um, as unofficial partners now probably close to 10 years. And um, it was always built, View Mortgage was built out of maybe the heart of serving people. And the thought process behind it um, for both the mortgage company and the home side um, isn't just to make a profit on an additional resource or on a different additional thing we can sell you, but it's really based on, can we deliver the customer a better experience? Can we control the process to make it simpler for them? Um, and so it's about service. Mm -hmm. And so it's so easy as we start thinking about more and more cities and more and more units. And, and we've seen this, especially over COVID, everyone was excited about their tech and, and about, um, you know, you can do everything on our phones and that, and that is true. And that's great. We both have our phones here and we both use them for everything. Um, but it's almost like what's old is new. I think at the end of the day, we really want to communicate with people. And I think that's what's in our heart to do is we want to communicate person to person. And so at View Mortgage, we're really trying to say, hey, let us help you with this whole experience from start to finish and, and make it a little more simply, um, a, a little simpler to, to accomplish that. Yeah. So would you say that's what sets y'all apart? Because in the real estate world, there are a lot of options mm -hmm. uh, for mortgage companies, people to pick from. There's a lot of lo different loan officers for buyers to use. Sure. So what would you say sets y'all apart? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, we're selling money, right? And there's tons of people mm -hmm. that do that, right? I mean, you could pull up your phone and you could find probably a thousand people who are willing to sell you money. It's it's not that special. But yeah, I think so. I think it's at the core of what we do is that we want to serve you and we want to serve people. And so that, that comes with building a, a quality home first and then putting you into the financing that hopefully works for you long term for your family. So it's understanding both sides of that. And it's not just, hey, buy money from us. We're, you know... We're, that just doesn't work anymore. And it's, mm -hmm. it's disingenuous. And I think people can tell when it, when that's the case. Yeah, absolutely. So what got you connected to view homes personally? So this is going back to 2000, probably 10, 11, when the market had just really kind of bottomed out. And, um, you know, you pointed out in a lot of ways, this market is very similar to that where, where a lot of people are going out of business. I think there was a statistic last week that I read in the Wall Street Journal that 135 lenders have either merged with a larger builder or a larger bank or gone out of business. And so it's a tough time for people in this industry um, as it was then. And I think it was really based around the, the relationship started with View Aspen View Homes in those days um, here locally um, as they were just looking for a good partner who could help get their get their buyers into financing. And so it started in some of those, um, you know, neighborhoods where we were really catering to, you know, a young military home um, buyer. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those areas on the south end of Colorado Springs is kind of what our, where it started. Um, and then over the years, it turned into to a, a true partnership. Uh, and, and we kicked off, you know, View Mortgage. So talk to me a little bit about the transition from becoming just a loan officer to one of the main owners of View Mortgage, just that business trail that you've been on. Um, have you read the Gladwell book, um, Outliers? Or, I haven't. Or seen it. So, so what he does in that story is he breaks down several different industries and how 
a lot of times it really wasn't that anyone was super special. He breaks down attorneys in New York. He talks about um, Bill Gates and the Microsoft movement. Um, I was I almost feel like that was me. There were so few mortgage people left after the crisis. And that's why I say a lot of it was just dumb luck um, that I think I was the right age to kind of pick back up again. I, you know, looking back, um, I think, well, boy, if I was a little older in a little different situation, I might not have had the energy to do it again. And so I took that opportunity that we had when there's just really, really hard times to really build a business that was focused on working with home builders and serving that clientele. Um, that goes back to my aunt who got me into the business in 2002. I, I'll never forget, I, I went and spent a, a month or two in Rochester, Rochester, New York, and they taught us how to be a loan officer, right? Um, so you're there with your computer and your mm -hmm. old calculator, and, and they teach you everything that you need to know. And, um, you know, I came back and, and I said, well, Auntie, how, well, now what do I do? And she's like, well, I think you need to find underserved communities. And so I spent the next couple of weeks uh, driving around upstate New York, um, calling on small home builders. And it was like such a novel idea. No one had ever thought to do that, apparently, because by the end of that week, I had like 100 clients and um, and everyone thought it was great. Boy, no one ever thought to drive up here. And so I took that same mentality when I moved to Colorado Springs and said, I, I find there's a ton of honor in home building. Um, I just, I love every bit about it. I love driving around communities that I can feel like I'm a part of and that they get built from scratch and the stories they get told there and the families that live there. And so I always knew from a really young age that I want to have a business that's builder focused. Um, and so that's, that was what my focus was. Now it took me a long time to do that, but when the market turned around, I think for, for you know, I was one of the few people that understood the space. Um, and so s about seven years ago, we started with, a, a, you know, we st I started creating partnerships with home builders at that time. And so, um, you know, we've done several of them now and, and view mortgage is one of them and, and is doing very well. So it's really out of a, of a mindset to what do home builders need and what is, what does the consumer need when they're going through that process? And, um, and it's a little bit different and it's just nuanced enough to where not every lender completely understands how the process works. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like your hustle too is also, I mean, the hustle, you just didn't stop. And that's kind of also what's brought you to where you are today, yeah, the partnerships maybe. and just not stopping. I mean, did you ever picture yourself here today? Did you ever think, yes, okay, my goal is to own a mortgage company? Um, in my early 20s, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but I always knew I wanted to build something. Um, and I knew I wanted to be connected with good people who had the same, the same values that I had. Um, and so I think those two things I knew I wanted and, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's, you know, we don't know where we're going to go, but all we know is that are we going to do the right steps today and we're going to do it tomorrow and we're going to do it again and again and again until we get the results that we want. But so often, especially in this culture, um, we do things once or twice, right? You mentioned the orange theory. Well, I went there twice and I haven't lost any weight yet. What's going on? Yeah. Right? Right. It, it doesn't work like that, right? You have to do it every single day mm -hmm. and you keep looking in the mirror and nothing's changed. And then finally, after weeks and weeks and weeks, you've noticed, oh, okay, I look different or I, I weigh less or I feel better. And, um, and that takes a while. And I think so often in business, especially for younger people, um, they want to put it, they say they want to put in the work, but then they'll put it in for a week or maybe a month or maybe even a few months. Um, and, and rarely do people want to do it consistently over the long haul. Yeah, we live in a world of immediate results. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it's hard to wait for, you know, that thing that will come way down the line. When you don't know when it's going to happen, right? True. I mean, when I showed up in Colorado Springs, business is booming. And it wasn't necessarily booming for me. I was new here uh, and I did well, but it wasn't until the market completely crashed that my business took off. Um, and so there's sometimes just these unique opportunities um, that you're able to take advantage of. Yeah. And so for people that are in the industry right now, or even home buyers that are considering buying, I think this is another opportunity, right? This is a disruptor. And we continually see every few years, there's some type of disruption. Um, and there's two types of people at that time. Most people just want to crawl away and hide and wait till the sun comes up again. Um, but there are always small groups of people that when these disruptions happen, um, they really decide they're going to go for it and they generally do very well. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about that. What would you say to someone, someone who wants to get into the mortgage industry or yeah, become a loan officer in this time right now? 
it's hard right now. Yeah. Um, it's really hard right now. You have to have the right partnerships and I think you have to have the perspective. Um, being a loan officer is exceptionally lucrative and a very good career for everyone I know who has done it professionally right now. Now, what I mean by professionally is hey, this is what I do. And so you would ask me before you started, like, have you done anything else? I'm like, no, I'm a, I'm a loan officer at heart, right? And I do some other things, but that's that's what I am and that's what I do. And when things were good, I enjoyed it. And when things were bad, I also had to enjoy it. And so we saw in this last downturn, um, everyone wanted to become a loan officer because they said, oh, you can make a lot of money in it. And that might be true. Um, but you can also have really hard times. And so I think it's, it's deciding, do you have the right skill set for it, right? And can I gut it out day after day after day to make it a business? And that's what I've always enjoyed. Um, the, loan aster, aspect, the loan officer aspect of this um, is that you can almost build your own business inside someone else's platform. Mm -hmm. And so it's really rewarding for a lot of people. I hired um, a gentleman who I'd been friends with for years and years, a few years ago, and he he, he had owned a business that was doing poorly because of COVID. And I said, hey, why don't you come in and, and look at this and see if this is something. He, and I knew he had the right skill set for it. He said, well, I want to own my own business. And he kept telling me that. And I said, well, just come on board and see, see how you like it. Well, now it's been a couple of years. And he said, well, this is great. I own my own business. I just happen to work with your company. Yeah. And so that's, if you have that mindset, um, I think that's probably the, the number one key. Yeah. What do you think the most important skill set? Or what's the most important attribute you need to have to be in this world? Um, you have to care about people yeah. fundamentally. Um, I, at different times in my career, I've seen really successful loan officers just really kind of taking a number. Um, and most of those people don't last long term. I think you really have to get back to this is a person, this is a family, this is a big decision for them. And if you understand those things and you can have their best interest at heart, um, I think that's probably the number one thing. Um, and you also have to be a kind of a teacher almost. You have to be willing to, to teach your skills to other people and help them understand, hey, this is how it works. This is the process. This is why you need to do this. I'm, I'm a firm believer um, that for most Americans, most middle-class Americans, their, their best by far opportunity to get ahead in their life is, is to purchase real estate. Mm -hmm. um, and there's almost no other tool that regular Americans have to generate wealth like they can in a home. Right. It's the American dream, truly. So for a buyer, because this right now, like we've been talking about this whole podcast, this the climate, the real estate climate, all the things. I have a friend who would love to purchase a house, but does not want to purchase in this climate. What do you encourage I say to her? What would you say to that buyer? Well, what does Warren Buffett say, right? He buys when everyone else is selling, and he's been consistently doing that for 75 years now. I, th I think now is probably one of those really unique opportunities for someone to purchase. Let me give you just some quick numbers. We mentioned that there's less than a million homes on the market nationally. We know that people have been on the sidelines, right? We know that people are buying homes, they're getting married, they're having families, they need a place to live. Um, people aren't buying simply because interest rates are higher than they've been. And that is a major deterrent, right? If I had to buy my house today at 6%, I'd be scared too. Um, but we're so wrapped up in monthly payment and we're less wrapped up in what does this do for my family long term? And so I would tell your friend, I would just show her the numbers. As soon as interest rates drop, maybe a percentage, which I think they probably will this summer, I think there's going to be millions of people that are flooding in to buy the 1 million homes on the market. And so I think there's a high likelihood that we're right back to a multiple offer situation. We're already seeing that in some markets around the country. Um, I think there's a really limited window of time for people who, if they if they are in a, the correct position to buy a home, that they probably need to do it now. Yeah. What happens in in a market is we can almost never time the bottom, right? Even though all of us say we're going to, right? Um, I like to trade stocks. I, I trade lots of different things, and we always think like we're going to get it at the exact bottom, and we just we just can't. Generally speaking, you have to get lucky to do it. Right now, I don't know if we're at the bottom or not of where the housing market's going to end up, but we know that sellers are fearful and buyers are also fearful. Well, what happens is as soon as we've hit the bottom and we've come out the other side of that, um, sellers are all of a sudden much more robust and I think houses prices are going to go up. And so the buyer, your friend, she's going to get a much better deal today than if she waits three months, in my opinion. Yeah, that makes so much sense because if you wait for interest rates to come down because of the limited you know, housing in the market, 
everything's going to become a war again, just like right. in 2020 and 2021. So. And then next thing you know, you're paying X amount of dollars over asking and, right. and then it just starts going nuts again. So, so yeah. basically what she has to ask herself, if I'm willing to pay a few thousand dollars additional in interest this year, right over the course of the year and refinance at a later date, but get the correct house that I want at the right price that I want. And we could pull up, you know, a bunch of data to show, okay, if I buy today, I pay more per month for the next 12 months or even two years um, versus what's going to happen if we wait. I think there's going to be a pretty obvious um, win for those people that were willing to, to go out on a yeah. ledge right now. Yeah, yeah. That's what I always say too. Just refinance in a couple <laughs> of years. It's easy to say. It's, it's to so do. easy to say, hard to do, hard to do. Yeah. yeah, but it makes sense why right now is this much smarter time to purchase then a couple months down the line. Absolutely. Yeah. Home builders like ours um, are doing massive incentives right now to help people buy. Um, you mentioned you met my brother at the gym earlier today. He's purchasing a home just down the street. Um, the seller was giving him concessions off the price of the house, so they dropped the price of the house. They've also given him money towards his closing cost, so his first year interest rate is at 2.5%. So wow. all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is a great deal, right? And so he's paying significantly less than if he bought the same house a year ago and he has the same payment. And so we're using a lot of um, alternative products like that that sellers are paying for to tier people into payments that they can afford. Yeah. Um, and so they're not adjustable rates. There's nothing really tricky about them, but there's a way that people can get in and still have it be very affordable. It's such a unique time to get creative with all mm -hmm. of that. That's what we're seeing in the real estate yeah. market. It's just yeah. people are getting creative and that's what happens. And the people that are doing well are finding ways to show buyers, hey, this is how you can make this work for your family um, versus the alternative, which is doing nothing. We know your rent's going up. We know that. Um, and so doing nothing doesn't, you know, people like to think, well, if I buy a house, it costs me. Well, no, the, the doing nothing probably costs you the most, right? And we've proven that over the long So time. true. And then typically you're just throwing away money because you're renting or right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And and that goes up and then you're paying someone else's mortgage and that's going up a hundred or 200 yeah. or $300 per Every year. year. And you don't even think about it. Right. What's the, I mean, you mentioned eggs, you know, obviously things have gone up. Um, people with 30 year fixed mortgages, their housing payment never goes up. That's kind of mind boggling when you think about it because everything else that you purchase goes up. Yeah. Um, but you can fix the house price you're in. Yeah. So you've experienced a lot of up and downs. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd love to know just something that maybe you regret or you wish that you did differently or you did do, didn't do when it comes to the business world from loan officer to you mortgage. What does that look like? Boy, that's hard. Um, my personality and my faith doesn't lead to regret. So I don't really look at anything um, as a gr regret. But as we were just talking about, it's that inaction. I look back so many times in my life where I didn't do something right. I didn't make action. I didn't, I didn't buy the house I should have bought. I didn't pick up another rental property. I didn't buy the stock when I should have. Right. And most of those decisions I think are fear-based. And so when I look back over the last, you know, 20 or 25 years that I've been in business, um, I think I probably regret letting fear dictate my decision-making at different times. And, um, and so I don't know if it's any one specific thing that I would say. I definitely wouldn't do that again, although I could tell you some stories probably that, that are too long for this. Um, but I, I think it's just that concept of I'm not going to do something because I'm scared or I'm fearful. Um, and so uh, maybe that, would be, that yeah. would be one thing. Yeah, that's huge. That encompasses so much more than just <laughs> <laughs> real estate in this world yeah. for sure. Okay. So I love to end every podcast with a question that may catch you a little off guard, but it's okay. a fun one. So you can take a deep breath. Okay. Uh, my question is what is, since we are the house of views, podcast, yes. how the view podcast, my question is what is your favorite view? My favorite view. Um, when I was coming up, the elevator right here and seeing this Pikes Peak view out to the west, that's that's pretty incredible. Yes. Um, I, was, I was thinking this morning as I was, as I was you know, when I got off the elevator on this fifth floor where we are right now, it's just kind of mind-boggling, um, really beautiful. It makes you think about this, this world that we have that God's created for us. So I don't know if that's my favorite view, but it's hard to beat that. It is a gorgeous one that we are blessed to see <laughs> every day in Colorado Springs yes. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, great. No, love that answer. Okay. Thank okay. you so yeah. much. Well, Rich, thanks so much for joining Thank us on you. the podcast. For me. Absolutely. You can come back anytime. 
Okay, I'll take you up on that. Perfect. Thank you. Well, that was the show. Thanks for tuning in to episode three of How's of You. We hope to see you on the next one. And don't forget, you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on YouTube. Go subscribe, go follow, go do all the things. See you on the next one.